Hello, students, and welcome back to U.S. Latin American Relations for module lecture number four from Interventionism to the Good Neighbor Policy. So we're going to be in the early 20th century from around 1900 to the end of World War II, about 1945. Um, during this period, we're going to go from extreme neocolonialism to um, a much more diplomatic approach under FDR during World War II, um, and we'll discuss uh, why that is. Um, but before we do that, I just want to say that I hope everyone had a restful um, spring break, that you had some time to review the syllabus, get a little bit acquainted with the Canvas page. Um, if you have any more questions for me about those things, please, please, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and do be aware that there are, you know, the, the user guides on Canvas, those are really helpful in a pinch um, if you don't have time to get in touch with me. And then, um, also with the library site, sometimes it can just be a real pain. Um, so you have to keep trying, make sure you're logged in. And sometimes if it tells you that you're timed out, you just have to refresh the page and it will let you in. Um, so if you're having trouble with the library, like with the library site, let me know. Um, it, sometimes you just have to kind of mess around with it. So I might be able to give you a few pointers on that. Um, okay. So let's dive in um, where we left off last week with the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, so by 1900, the United States has won the War of 1898. It has colonies in, or territories, protectorates in the Pacific Ocean, um, as well as in the Caribbean. Um, and it is a world power, both economically and militarily at this point. President Theodore Roosevelt, who is pictured very comically here in a political cartoon um, as a rough rider in the war of 1898, um, decides to expand upon the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine and name the United States a, quote, international police power in certain situations. The, um, this initially responds to a border dispute between Venezuela and Great Britain that we spoke about, um, but most of these interventions are going to be based on keeping the Europeans from um, occupying Latin American countries for debt collection. So basically the idea is if you guys don't know how to pay your debts and keep the Europeans out of our backyard, then we'll have to take over until you learn how to deal with it yourself. Um, is kind of the idea here. So let's talk about some of these interventions. Of course, we have the War of 1898 and the Venezuela boundary dispute. You have the Panamanian independence and the construction of the Panama Canal. You have the creation of the receivership in the Dominican Republic in 1907. And then the Marines in Nicaragua, um, they go in in 1927, but they're there for a very long time. You have Cuba and the Platt Amendment. Um, and then you have President Woodrow Wilson and his intervention during the Mexican Revolution, which we'll talk a little bit about. So first we're gonna discuss the Dominican receivership. So this is the first real claim of the United, of Roosevelt, uh, or the first real, the first time that the United States actually enforces the idea of itself as an international police force. Um, in 1904, the Dominican Republic is um, under an enormous amount of, amount of debt. They had to fight a war of independence from Haiti. Um, they've been at war with Haiti for a while and that's just depleted um, all, of, all of the money that they have. Um, so in 1905, Roosevelt forces the Dominican government to sign an agreement to um, appoint one US citizen as receiver of customs, which gives this one individual um, as an agent of the US government control over all of the Dominican Republic's um, income. And then this person will pay the, 
the Dominican Republic's debts and then give the Dominican Republic whatever's left, which is basically nothing. Um, this is a very in informal executive agreement until 1907 when Congress um, codifies it into law with a treaty. Um, the Dominican Republic is very politically unstable and in 1912 the president is assassinated um, and Woodrow Wilson sends the U.S. Marines to occupy the Dominican Republic and they're there um, training police things of that nature until 1924. Yikes so that's the story of some early intervention in the Dominican Republic. In Nicaragua, um, Nicaragua is in Central America, so we're talking, you know, a, a coffee elite. We're talking big produce companies like United Fruit are making their way around in there. Um, and so in 1927, a rebel leader, Augusto Cesar Sandino, um, leads a rebellion against a U.S. occupation. Um, under the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, Sandino wasn't a communist, but the US saw him that way. The Russian Revolution has already happened. And even though the Cold War hasn't officially started, the United States is already very wary of communism in Latin America. Um, so Sandino is actually a nationalist and wants the Nicaraguan people to benefit from their resources, wants the Nicaraguan people to have control of their government, wants the U.S. out. Um, and, and Washington sees that nationalism as communism. Um, and so the Marines help what's left of the Nicaraguan government military kind of put down this rebellion. Um, and in 1937 um, begins to back um, a dictator named Somoza um, and this Somoza family rules Nicaragua until the outbreak of the Civil War um, decades later. So we'll talk um, a little bit more about that, but um, Sandino is going to be kind of an inspiration for nationalist um, revolutionaries in from from the time that this rebellion begins um, to the present day in in Latin America. Another notable intervention is Woodrow Wilson um, sending the army in after Pancho Villa. Um, so the Mexican Revolution is incredibly complex and incredibly complicated. Um, basically Porfirio Diaz is a dictator, not always actual president, but the, the man behind the scenes, um, the ruler of Mexico for about 34 years, something like that. Um, and he's very hated. And a couple different rebellions break out when he wants to run for reelection the last time and a new leader is put in through elections, um, Francisco Madero, but he wasn't revolutionary enough for the revolutionaries who had actually risked their lives. And so he is, so rebellions break out against him and he's assassinated and a dictator takes over, Victoriano Huerta. And Woodrow Wilson refuses to recognize him he places an arms embargo so he won't um, send them weapons to fight the revolutionaries who are still rebelling um, and blockaded Veracruz so that the Germans couldn't send him weapons. Um, he's so there's widespread war, not only popular armies led by Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, these are kind of popular names um, in Mexican culture, if you know anything about the revolution. Um, they're fighting, but there are also wealthy revolutionaries known as the constitutionalists, um, the Sonora dynasty that are um, fighting for power. So Mexico is just an upheaval and this is, and this is along the border. And there's constant unrest along the border because 
rebel troops are sneaking back and forth across the border, smuggling arms, getting money, doing, doing things of that nature. And there are all these little skirmishes happening along the border. Um, US citizens trying to keep Mexicans out of their territory, all sorts of different things. Um, and in one instance, Pancho Villa and his men actually cross the border and ha do this violent raid on a U.S. town. And in response, Wilson sends the army chasing after Pancho Villa. Um, they chase after him for 11 months all throughout Mexico and um, never find him. And what's interesting about this is that many... Um, that a lot of the people who went down after Pancho Villa learned about the revolution and decided that it was something they wanted to join. Um, people who believed um, in like late strong labor rights, burgeoning socialist and communist movements in the United States, um, Americans are going down um, to join some of the armies of the Mexican revolution. You even have just your, your kind of run of the mill um, conservative Americans joining because they oppose the dictatorship of Victoriano Huerta. Um, so this is one instance of some cross-border solidarity between U.S. citizens and the people of Mexico, even if it's only kind of fleeting and on an individual basis. Now this policy of intervention changes with the outbreak of the Great Depression and um, and the rise of Hitler intentions in Europe. And so when FDR, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes president, he introduces a new policy known as the good neighbor policy. And it actually renounces military intervention. And it, instead of trying to assert U.S. hegemony in the region through military strength. FDR wants to promote um, stronger relationships based on economic and cultural cooperation and exchange. Um, so this is very, very much so an attempt to maintain the loyalty of Latin American nations to the United States and the allied powers as um, Germany is becoming more belligerent as Japan is on the move, as the Allies need materials um, to fight in World War II. And here you can see kind of a, just a little bit of a, an illustration of the good neighbor, um, pretty stereotypical drawings of FDR and the Mexican people that he's apparently treating as a good, a good neighbor. So why, why is FDR concerned that Latin America might not remain loyal? Well, World War I and the Great Depression really affect um, the U.S. economic influence on Latin America because global trade overall decreases 60%. Um, and, and so Latin America's economy really suffers from this. Um, they don't have places to export their agricultural products, which rot in the field. Um, no one's purchasing materials from their mines. And so during the 19 teens um, and the 1920s and coming into the Great Depression, Latin American leaders began to change the way they think about their economic policy. So they start to turn away from um, the drive to attract so much foreign investment towards more economic nationalism, wanting to increase their own economic self-sufficiency. Um, so they're going to, some of them are going to expropriate privately owned commodities, including land. Um, you know, Mexico's going to create Pemex, its national gas company, our oil company and expropriate standard oils holdings. Bolivia is going to do the same. Um, and they're going to place them under state control, 
resource nationalism is going to be a big deal. Um, so they're going to, rather than um, allowing foreign companies to say own, own the oil that's in the ground, these countries are going to begin to say that that oil belongs to us, that natural gas belongs to us. These new economic policies are going to be based on some economic theory um, that's really popular in the early 20th century. And this is modernization theory. Um, and as you can see here in the chart, um, what moder modernization theory posits is that all nations are going to follow the same path to development. So that if Latin America continues exporting primary resources, eventually it will industrialize and develop in the same way as the United States did as a colony that was exporting primary resources to begin with. Um, so you go from the traditional society to beginning to build some infrastructure communications. So we're talking about the transportation revolution here. You have rapid growth um, with an industrial revo revolution. Um, you're moving from the industrial revolution to a technological revolution to a level of high mass consumption, which is what we would say um, the developed world, the Western world sits in. Um, to achieve, to kind of jumpstart their path towards modernization, Latin American governments, Latin American economic theorists began to promote this idea called import substitution industrialization or ISI. Um, so it's, it's an attempt to industrialize their economies, but it's also an attempt to make up for shortages of finished goods that they experienced during the Great Depression. So what it does is it takes the increased state revenue from nationalized resources and industries to fund state-driven industrialization in specific, um, in specific industries. So for instance, in Argentina, they started building Argentine cars and refrigerators. Um, they have their own factories for television sets, things of that nature. At this time, European immigrants, um, there's a flood of European immigrants, both to the United States and to Latin America. And in both instances, they bring with them um, these new kind of leftist ideas, communism, anarchism, socialism, um, and new populist leaders are going to come to power, um, promising to enact social reforms in exchange for for support from these, these new leftist movements. So these things include um, labor regulations like an eight hour work, de work day, um, social security for workers, um, safety regulations, things of that nature. Um, this is also a period in Latin America where voting rights are extending beyond just these male pro white male property owners. Um, so you're you're having some of say second generation immigrants beginning to be able to vote. So this is changing the politics, kind of giving it a more nationalist, more leftist kind of orient, um, which is something that the United States would not have tolerated, but is going to kind of let go a little bit under the good neighbor policy. This is the time in Latin America where nations are finally beginning to form these new national identities. Um, so nationalism is a strong component, not just economic nationalism, but political nationalism, which promotes the idea of a strong state, pride in the nation, um, identifying as a member of the nation and economic development for the betterment, for the modernization of the nation. Um, Latin American nationalists are responding to the neocolonial period where they're suffering interventions from Europe, more from the United States, but from Europe as well. 
Um, and there's a change in ideology in Latin America around this time where the old ideas, um, well, where the ideas of white supremacy that are emanating out of the United States and Western Europe are rejected in favor of promoting um, an idea of a mixed race heritage that valorizes certain parts of their indigenous or African heritages while still promoting um, economic development and, and, and modernization. Um, so increasing um, public education and sanitation and expanding communication networks and um, you know, railroads and, and all of those things. <clears throat> so how did Latin America participate in World War I? Seven of the nations of Latin America remained neutral, um, which meant that they continued selling resources to, um, to our enemies, to Germany, Prussia, and that was not something that the US wanted to face again in World War II. Um, but the real kicker was in 1917 when the Germans sent what is known as the Zimmerman telegram to the Mexican government. The German government wanted the Mexicans to invade the United States and distract them from the war in Europe. And they, want, and they said that in exchange, they would give them weapons and money and support in order to take back the, the land that they lost in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Of course, the US intercepted it. We don't know what Mexico would have done. My guess is probably not have antagonized the United States, but who knows? So how did the good neighbor policy work? One thing that the US did was economic aid. They made trade deals that set price controls and reduced tariffs um, and provided development aid to help construct infrastructure and expand education programs and sanitation and you know, running water service and all of these things. Um, another huge aspect of the good neighbor policy was cultural diplomacy. So these are cultural programs that promote a shared sense of identity um, in the Western hemisphere um, and the idea of Pan-Americanism that we've talked about already briefly. Cultural programs from this era are going to be the foundation of some of the exchange programs that we still know of today. So for instance, bringing students in from Latin America to study at US universities and sending um, US citizens to study in Latin America, um, exchanging professors, exchanging artists, exchanging um, directors and all sorts of things. Um, this, this time period is when these types of exchanges begin. A central component um, of the good neighbor policy is what's known as the Office of the Coordinator for Inter-American Affairs. Um, this is led by Nelson D. Rockefeller from 1941 to 1945, so during the years that the United States is actively at war. It has the following objectives. Prevent access influence in the Americas. Why are they concerned about access influence in the Americas? Well, before the invasion of Poland, I don't know how much you all know about the 30s and the rise of Hitler and, and fascism, um, but I actually think this is a timely topic for the, the um, days that we're living in. Um, there were fascist movements, strong fascist movements in other parts of Europe. Um, so for instance, there's this huge fascist march um, in London um, that gets a lot of attention. There um, is actually a fascist plot to overthrow the government after FDR is elected um, by some leading businessmen in the United States. Um, there's a lot of admiration for Mussolini when he comes to power in Italy and, and for Hitler. Um, you know, the United, this is a time in the United States where um, 
eugenics is being practiced, um, white supremacy, you know, Jim Crow is still law of the land in the South and James Crow is operating in the North. Um, so fascism wasn't um, really a bad word until Hitler invaded Poland. Um, and the same is true in Latin America. There are a lot of fascist influence in, in, um, in Latin America. Juan Perón, um, famous populist from Argentina. Um, some of you may know him as the husband of Evita from the movie that uh, Madonna starred in. Um, but uh, he was actually um, accused by the United States of working directly with the Nazis. Um, you have Alfredo Stroessner, in Paraguay, who was a dictator in Paraguay for a very long time during the Cold War, who was actually very close with Francisco Franco of Spain. And so um, it, wasn't, it wasn't far from the realm of possibility that a friendly, gov that a government in Latin America might be friendly to, to Nazi Germany and to Mussolini in, in Italy. So. Um, their first goal is to keep the Axis influence out of the Americas. Their next is to promote trade. They want to be selling things to Latin America, but they also want to have um, access to things like rubber and steel and um, agricultural goods to feed um, the war effort, things of that nature. Um, one of its objectives is to cultivate a greater cultural understanding between Latin America and the United States. Another is to promote the idea of the American way of life and that supporting the United States and the allies in World War II and a victory over fascism would give Latin Americans access to a middle-class lifestyle, basically saying, if you stick with us, we'll help you develop so you can live like us. Um, and during this period, there's a growing urban middle class in Latin America that's watching U.S. movies and using products made in the United States, listening to music and wearing clothes and eating food from the United States, where prior to this time, more of the kind of cultural influence um, in Latin America is coming from from Europe, uh, particularly France. Um, so the US really starts to take kind of a cultural, um, over culturally in the Western hemisphere in this, in this time. So how successful is the good neighbor policy? How much participation does Latin America have in World War II? None of the Latin American nations remained neutral. Every single one, even Chile, which held out till the very, very end because it was afraid um, that its Pacific coast was very vulnerable to a Japanese attack similar to Pearl Harbor. Um, all of them actually declared war against the Axis powers during World War II. Uh, cooperation on trade gave allied powers access to these raw materials that they needed. Um, Mexico and Brazil actually contributed troops to fight in the war to take back Europe. Some of them per participated in D-Day. Um, and in exchange for U.S. military aid to help bolster the militaries in Mexico, Brazil, and in, Cent in Central America, the U.S. gained access to military bases in the region. Um, and here you can see some, some officers or some soldiers from the Mexican Air Force, some pilots. Um, these are the, the flying Aztecs. I, I don't think that the Mexicans themselves painted this on this plane in English and quite so stereotypically, but who knows? All right. So I hope that that gave you a little easier understanding of what was going on in the chapter for this week um, and a little bit more background. 
key concept quiz four should be pretty straightforward. For your short answer quiz three this week, um, you're looking at an article by Monica Rankin um, that discusses an OCIA funded relief project in El Oro, Ecuador. Um, so you get to look at one of the projects that the OCIA tried to implement on the ground in Latin America during this period. And as you're reading, you'll want to pay attention to the stated and achieved goals of the project, how those goals maybe compare with one another and why there might be disparities between the stated and achieved goals um, of this project. And in module activity four, we're going to explore the OCIA more by watching a Disney movie that is live action and animated um, that was created in conjunction with the OCIA. Um, so you'll be asked to determine whether or not you think the film is an effective piece of propaganda for a Pan-American identity or Pan-American movement and explain why. Um, so I hope you have a little bit of fun with that. And then your secondary source analysis activity for this week, activity three on the sources. Um, this is um, about identifying the primary sources. So remember, primary sources are sources from the time period, from people who were involved. Um, be very, very specific. Um, don't tell me government documents, tell me census records, tell me legal cases, tell me export import data, things of that nature. And don't say interviews, interviews with whom was there a specific group that those interviews targeted? Um, was there a particular, were there any concerns um, that the author mentioned before with the con conducting of these interviews? Um, so just be as specific as possible. The more specific you are in this activity, the less work you'll have to go back and do for writing your paper. So um, I do expect you to be rather specific that in, in methodology, the specificity of your sources matters. Um, so I guess that's all I have for you this week. Um, I will have some grades for you beginning tomorrow, so you'll be able to see um, my comments on my work as you're moving forward um, and be able to get begin to apply those. And I'll have your next lecture ready for you earlier than, than I had this one. I just had some family stuff going on, but we're, we're everyone's okay. Everyone's okay. Just, just a, a little bit of busyness. Um, nothing to be concerned about, but... I wish you all well, and please reach out if you need anything from me. Have a great night. Bye.